Thank you very much. So I'm uh, Francis Chenwell from the University of Zurich. Thank you very much, Samantha, for inviting me. Merci bien. Um, it's a pleasure and honor uh, to speak to you here today on democracy and democratic representation. Uh, actually, there's a lot of overlap um, between my take uh, on, on the subject matter uh, with uh, what you have just heard from uh, Philippe Petit, because the the idea of democracy or democratic representation is that uh, the international realm should be a representation of peoples <clears throat> and not of states, so to speak. So uh, the, the entity, the legitimate entity that is supposed to be represented is the people. Um, and very much also in the sense of le peuple constitué, uh, the, the people as it is uh, constituted by constitutions, uh, by um, you know, status functions, offices, office holders, procedures, um, and uh, institutions that give it authoritative legitimacy <coughs> um, that actually uh, allow it to govern. So it's the governing uh, people. <coughs> and uh, this is about uh, the government of the people's uh, democracy. Um, whereby the overarching entity is not, again, a people, uh, um, but it's uh, peoples governing together as a union, not as a unit. <coughs> um, and um, so the idea is very much that uh, international relations, uh, um, insofar as um, in the uh, authoritative, binding, uh, law-giving proce processes uh, are concerned should be uh, mapped or construed on this principle that it's uh, about um, the peoples. And I go through this in my paper. It's a very preliminary paper. I apologize for all the lack of streamlining and uh, incoherences still that are in the paper and typos, of course. Um, also, I was very much inspired by the reading of the other contributions. And of course, uh, this is interesting. Before a conference, one approaches it from one side and then gets inspired and, of course, learns a lot from the others. And so the final product, I assure you, Samantha, will be, <laughs> will be much better because it will, be, um, it will have learned from, from the other inputs. And it's, of course, a very small um, input I give. So I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I do not pretend to give you know, very concrete uh, guidance on the institutional design of international lawmaking, nor do I pretend to describe it in any way in a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive uh, manner. <clears throat> so uh, just a couple, um, a, a couple things about my paper. Um, yes, so I think the, the relevant entity or unit to be represented are not the states. The states are but instruments. They are apparatuses uh, of rationality in the service uh, of the peoples. Um, and so, of course, the first question is, what is, what is the people? And uh, again, here, uh, there's overlap with what Philippe Petit says. I have a very Republican, Ciceronian approach to, uh, to the people. It is uh, not just uh, the population. Uh, the population is, of course, important because the population is the is what is supposed to be protected and, and guided uh, in their interests. But uh, uh, the people is constituted by rules and composed by citizens. And of course, the notion of citizen is also um, a difficult one because in a sense, it's true, but Philippe Petit says, il y a le citoyen constituant. But, of, but this leads you into a circularity because the citizen doesn't really exist before the people is constituted and established. So uh, there is also the citoyen constitué. Huh? When we hold a passport, we are a citoyen or citoyenne constitué. <coughs> and the citoyen constituant is sort of the, is a citizenship in a non, in a pre-legal, pre-political sense of having a duty, a natural duty to uphold just institutions. And so far we are citoyen constituant. But insofar as we hold uh, the office of citizens of a, of a, of a certain uh, pop, uh, people, we are uh, citoyen constitué. And um, when I hear talk about the people, it's of course the people that is constituted by rules, composed by citoyens 
constitué, constitué. And what is important about such kind of a people, which is a democratic people as opposed to non-democratic people, is that these citizens have normative powers, which citizens in an autocratic regime do not have. They have the power to vote. They have the power to contest. They have the power um, to interfere, to stand for office, etc. <clears throat> And in that sense, uh, the people can be sovereign uh, over the population. Uh, you, by, you thereby also, if you're interested in political philosophy, you thereby avoid the paradox of popular sovereignty because you cannot be sovereign over yourself. You cannot be subject and sovereign at the same time. That's a paradox. But the people as peuple constitué can be sovereign over uh, the population. Um, and uh, this is what I go through. And that, that's the basis, because if we take this to international uh, sphere, uh, again, uh, the citizens, and this is, again, an overlap with what Philippe Petit says, are very important. So uh, peoples are accountable to each other as peoples, and they are accountable to the citizens of other peoples. Uh, and that's what democratic uh, representation um, then is, is really uh, all about. <coughs> Um, oh yeah, I should have changed the slide. <laughs> so essentially, what I what I just said is is on this is on this slide. And so uh, it's a question of composition and uh, of the deontic powers uh, of, of citizens. Um, now, a word on representation, and uh, we have already heard again uh, from Philippe Petit a little bit uh, on this. Uh, notion of representation, what it can mean. Um, essentially, I think it's important uh, to, you know, just analytically uh, distinguish between uh, representation as standing for and acting for, and of course, democratic representation that, are, that we are interested in here is not just the symbolic representation of standing for, uh, like a flag stands for uh, the nation, etc but uh, the representation as acting for, and that comes in essentially two forms. Um, one we have talked about is this uh, assembly of ambassadors, which is essentially assembly of delegates. So R is a delegate with a mandate from A. Um, so this is the uh, figure of representation as mandate. So delegates have a mandate, ambassadors have a mandate from the governments to you know, defend a certain position, to bargain uh, for a certain interest, etc. In this sense, the represented puts an obligation on the representative, the delegate, to carry out an act. Um, but democratic representation cannot work that way if it is in any way to be also a deliberation about uh, representatives who then uh, come to decisions that are binding for the representative. So the very, m the more important figure of representation is actually the one where uh, R has a representative power to bind A. So, you know, our representatives in parliament, they are not just our delegates to whom we give a mandate and who we put under a uh, an obligation. They put us under an obligation. So the, the direction of obligation giving is exactly the opposite. Uh, Representative have, representatives have representative powers, which are, they have these deontic powers to bind those whom they represent. Uh, and of course, um, that, that is uh, not the power of a delegate. That is a power of somebody who has representative uh, powers. Um, and uh, again, um, this, is, this is important to, to keep in mind also in the international sphere because <clears throat> as we talk about democratic uh, representation, um, this has to be, uh, in a way, the case that uh, there is room for filtering of interests, for, for um, deliberation, uh, and for compromise that has not been part of the original uh, mandate. Um, and then there's a way how this should be tied back to, of course, the, the power um, of the people. <coughs> um, now I think, uh, the, the, my, you, I don't know, I, I'm not have, keeping any time, um, so you just interrupt me uh, when I go over time, please. Uh, I have some time left? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, now, when it comes to the representation of peoples vis-a-vis -vis each other, I think uh, we should 
take account of the fact that uh, domestically the people as a peuple constitué um, is represented in very different types of institutions, legislative, executive, judicial, very different types of procedures, different office holders. Um, and um, I would also subscribe as Philippe Petit to a notion of sovereignty of the people, um, popular sovereignty. But I think it's more adequate to think none of those institutions alone is the sovereign um, in a democracy, so it's not, uh, but the system, uh, sovereignty emerges from the interaction of uh, legitimate authorized institutions, procedures, office holders, um, sovereign verdicts emerge from um, this institutional process and maybe the democratic system as a whole um, is the peuple constitué and is, uh, is sovereign. So <clears throat> no individual um, institution uh, is Sovereign. That's, of course, again something we could we could you know think about much more. Um, but even uh, if you if you if you take the, the famous UK model where it's the king or queen in Parliament that is sovereign, so the holder of sovereignty is very much uh, also there in a way diffused between um, the king or the queen and the Parliament. And I think. Sovereignty in this sense is diffused in a democratic system, uh, but we shouldn't get rid of sovereignty uh, just by saying because it's diffused because we can clearly identify the procedures that lead to the authoritative verdicts also in, a, in any kind of system also um, um, in the Swiss system. Now, um, the reason why I think we shouldn't just think about democracy but about democracy is very much that the peoples who do not want to merge and fuse into one overarching large people, but who have the right to be autonomous and, and sovereign and need to be sovereign in order to deliver, um, deliver government. Um, these peoples are nonetheless uh, accountable to each other. Uh, one of the fundamental ideas, normative ideas of, uh, of democracy is accountability. Um, and uh, so even if uh, there is an internal um, sovereignty, the sovereigns as such exist thanks to a rule of their cognition among sovereigns. In a way, a sovereign is a sovereign because the sovereign is recognized by other sovereigns. So there's always a rule of recognition at the basis of sovereignty. Sovereignty comes into existence thanks to an internal and external, externally accepted rule of recognition. And so the accountability of sovereigns vis-a-vis -vis each other is absolutely constitutive. Uh, for for the very ontologically for the very existence of the sovereigns, and in a normative way, it's part of uh, of democracy. No no institution uh, should be non-accountable, <clears throat> and that is true for le peuple constitué as well. Uh, le peuple constitué should not be just accountable to nobody. Um, and of course, there are internal checks and balances. So there's an internal um, accountability mechanism which balances uh, the institutional system, but uh, there should be an external uh, mechanism. And that's why I think uh, the, uh, there's a horizontal accountability due among the peoples um, um, towards each, so there's a, an accountability towards uh, each other. Um, and there's a sense in which you can also think of democracy as something that is actually not just in the clouds uh, or in the ideas of some, some philosophers, but it's actually, I, I would agree to a certain extent, it's all already a fact because um, as we've heard, democracy is not just about the formal decision-making mechanisms of the procedures, it's also very much about deliberation. So what comes before the decision-making is deliberation, what comes after decision-making is again deliberation. And that deliberation of a demos, of a people, is not limited to the card-carrying citizens, the passport-carrying citizens. Anybody can opinionate. I here, as a Swiss citizen, can enter in a dialogue with you who should be the next uh, president of France. We, can, we will all, I'm sure we will, uh, give our opinions and deliberate about who should be the next president of the United States. So the deliberative demos is one 
as soon as the demos has freedom of press and freedom of expression, the demoi are open towards each other uh, in their deliberations. So there is democracy in the deliberative sense uh, as a fact, not only as a, as a normative uh, aspiration. And so this accountability of demoi to each other is something that's happening already, maybe not at the formal institutional level so much, but very much at the informal level of citizens as we engage transnationally, trans, uh, trans democratically, uh, uh, we engage into how we should govern each other's countries and what we could learn from each other. And um, as, so as citizens, I think we engage uh, in deliberative processes that are very much uh, democratic already because we, we give opinion, we give reason about what should be going on in other countries and we give also, we try to, um, you know, to, to maybe justify what or explain the position of our own uh, countries, of our own systems and how they're different from others. So this, uh, this form of reason giving, of trans-border reason giving, trans-border of Demoy. Uh, reason giving is something that is actually factually going on. Uh, and so my point would just be that uh, what we need maybe to think about is uh, also to, to take the moment of decision making, and not only the moments of deliberation, but also the moments of decision making into, uh, into account when we, when we speak about uh, um, the accountability that is to be assured among uh, DEMOI. There it is. So, um, yeah, just to conclude, if I may, still have a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so the, the point would be, if you take all of that I've said, uh, if one takes it at seriously, then I think what we need to think about is also that uh, this institutional, um, the multiplicity of institutions that actually constitute the people, um, when you think about democratic representation, we have to not only talk about, you know, parlamentarization, uh, etc., of of, uh, of international organizations. First of all, it's, it's a bottom-up construction. Uh, so, so a democracy. The first condition is that the uh, members, uh, the groups that are members of peoples, are democratic, democratically organized peoples with citizens that have normative powers um, to govern. Um, but secondly, I think it's important uh, to carry this over to all institutions because the institutions, the manifestations or expressions of the people are, are manifold. They are not only legislative, they're also executive and they're also judicial. And I think uh, when we think about a democratic system of representation, um, then um, we should think about representation via all these institutional types. Uh, that actually constitute uh, the people. <clears throat> so we have to get rid of the executive-centered, state-centered, um, 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 and I agree again there with uh, Philippe T of, uh, of the of the doctrine. Um, but uh, we have to also expand, I think, uh, representation into the judicial and the. Uh, uh, the legislative domains. And of course, um, again, this is not a pure utopia in many ways. This is, of course, happening and it's very, I'm not saying how, how it should be organized again in, in detail, uh, but I think uh, it's important that the international organizations uh, and the different types of international organizations, be they more legislative or more functional, epistemic, or more judicial, um, or their dimensions, their judicial, epistemic, legislative, etc. dimensions should be organized so that uh, the representation is, uh, is taken up to the uh, democratic level of all those institutions and not just, uh, not just the executives. Um, and so this, this would be my, my conclusion then, so that the democratic representation needs to be designed in, in common institutions of the peoples that unite all those highest governmental institutions of the people 
namely the a council of, it, of legislators, the council of executives, but also um, I think the judiciary. <coughs> and this is also something that's interesting when you think about the European Union. Uh, we have, of course, there's of course the European Court of Justice, and then you have the national courts, high courts, and uh, the German court uh, takes part in a very interesting um, discussion and has its own decisions, and, and, and this is very important to, for the European Union, but I think what will be needed is that all the, that there is maybe a council of all the courts, or uh, that all the courts together uh, coordinate uh, and are accountable uh, to each other and, and reflect uh, upon uh, the judicial representation of the peoples. Um, so that's, uh, I think my time is over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Shinovel.